Nintendo is definitely one of the companies of all time. But no matter how fashionable their business practices are or how much they hate their fans, there is no doubt that they do handhelds better than anyone else. They have reigned supreme in the handheld market since 1989 since the original Game Boy was released. You can take it anywhere you want to go. Go, go, go. Go with the power of the NES right in the palm of your hand. Game Boy. And in this almost three and a half decade of being at the top, they faced next to no competition. Today, Nintendo and handhelds are so simultaneous to each other that when I say a handheld console, you hear the switch. So in this video, I'll be going over the history of Nintendo's handheld consoles. Even before the Game Boy was the Game & Watch, which was literally a game and a watch. Inspired by a bored businessman playing with his calculator on a train, this behemoth of a console can run games at the same frame rate as every single modern AAA title on release day. The Game & Watch had a wide variety of games like Paul, Fire, Mario, Cement Factory and Donkey Kong. The only problem being that there were no cartridges. So every Game & Watch came with a singular game and every time you wanted to play another, you had to buy a separate device each and every time. This did not stop people from buying multiple of them and by the end of its life cycle, it had sold over 54 million copies because it was certainly better than fidgeting with your calculator on a long train ride. The scope of the Game & Watch was pretty limited as it was not any more powerful than the calculator it was inspired by. But this wasn't the case for the Game Boy that came after. The Game Boy was probably the biggest landmark leap in the history of handheld. It could handle complete role-playing games, having a vast world filled with different kinds of things to explore. The most famous being the Pokemon and the Legend of the Zelda franchises. It had an 8-bit processor and a 160 by 144 pixel screen, and it could do all this at no less than 60 FPS. It had interchangeable cartridges, meaning long gone were the days where you needed to buy an entire device to play a different game. You can just pop a cartridge in and out. The starting price of $89 and a longer battery life also gave it an edge over its competition, the Atari Lynx and the Sega Game Gear, which were priced around $150. The only thing that the Game Boy lacked was color, which was promptly fixed with the release of the Game Boy Color. The Game Boy Color was technically a revision of the original Game Boy, but the improvements were so great that it was hard not to acknowledge it as its own separate console. The Game Boy Color was slimmer and was powerful enough to render 56 different colors. It even had backwards compatibility so you can play your old Game Boy games if you wanted to without keeping two separate devices. In brief, it was everything the Game Boy, but taken up a notch. Unlike the Game Boy Color, which was an upgrade to the already existing Game Boy, the Game Boy advanced to the fully-fledged new console. It was a lot more powerful than the Game Boy Color and could display 608 times the number of colors possible on it. The Game Boy Advance came with two CPUs on board, one 8-bit chip for backwards compatibility with the Game Boy and Game Boy Color games, and another modern ARM-based chip to run the native GBA games. Although it had an issue with not having a backlit screen, it was fixed the next year in 2003 with the release of the Game Boy SP, which in fact sold more copies than the GBA. The games noticeably looked a lot better as developers could add more details into the game due to having a larger color palette to work with. To show you a comparison, here's Pokemon Red side by side to its GBA remake Pokemon Fire Red. Only a year later, Nintendo came out with a console that till this day still is the most sold handheld and the second most sold console of all time, right behind the PS2 by a margin of less than a million. Selling a staggering 154 million total copies, released in 2004, the Nintendo DS was the successor to the Game Boy Advance, and like it, it had backwards compatibility with the previous generations. It was a huge upgrade from the GBA, the graphics had gone from 2D to 3D, the two screens meant that there were a lot more possibilities in game development, and it had touch control through the use of a stylus. It was a big leap, risky but innovative at the same time. But at the end of the day, Nintendo pulled it off well. The key to the success was probably the fact that these features weren't just a gimmick but were actually implemented in many games. The DS was also the first console to bring online connectivity so you can play multiplayer games via the internet globally instead of using wires to connect devices. As it was such a successful console, it was also a console that Nintendo waved out a lot, stretching its lifespan to almost 7 years and during this time there were 3 revisions launched. 
The DS Lite, as the name suggests, was a slimmer, lighter version of the original DS, released in 2006. It had massive quality of life improvements over the original DS, having a brighter screen, a more comfortable stylus, and a longer battery life. And these overhauls made it the best out of all the DSs, selling over 94 million copies. The DSi released in 2008 was the first of the Nintendo handles to make full use of the internet. It had a game store, a web browser, and an inbuilt music player. But it also took out the dedicated slot for GBA cartridges, meaning that the GBA games had to be downloaded from the Wii U virtual console. But not all the games were available there, and many were region locked. But for that removal from the DSi, there were plenty of good features added to it as well, like the front and a back camera, an SD card slot, the internet browser and music player we discussed earlier, as well as other useful features like voice recording and photo editing software along with a bigger screen. As for the DSi XL, it was a DSi with an even bigger screen. Unlike the DS, the main feature or the gimmick of the next console, the 3DS, didn't work out that well. Viewing your games in 3D through the naked eye is an interesting concept, but in practicality it does not work out that well. The 3D mode worked by using the parallax battery technology. The 3D effect was created by projecting slightly different images to each eye. The parallax barrier is a special layer of lenses located in the front of the 3DS's screen that helps to guide these different images to the correct eye. When you view the 3DS screen from a certain distance and angle, your left eye sees one set of images while your right eye sees a slightly different set of images. While impressive, the 3D effect caused eye strain and headaches for some players and the sweet spot for viewing the 3D effect was very small. Additionally, the battery life of the 3DS was not very good, with only around 3-5 to five hours of gameplay on a single charge. Another problem was the lack of a second analog stick, which made some games very difficult to control. It wasn't all bad though, having more power meant that the 3D was well, more 3D. The 3DS also included a gyroscope and an accelerometer, which allowed for motion controls in certain games. It improved upon the multimedia aspect of the DS by improving upon the online connection, the camera, video and audio playback. The Street Pass and Sports Pass allowed 3DS users to exchange data with other users via Wi-Fi or through Nintendo servers. Users could exchange game data, be characters and even receive messages and software updates from Nintendo. The eShop allowed purchase and download of digital games and other content. This included a wide variety of games as well as video content such as TV shows and movies. The 2DS was launched as a cheaper, more affordable version, mainly aimed at kids. It removed the 3D feature of the 3DS while keeping all of the other features intact, in a slate-like design that noticeably lacked hinges. The 2DS sold a respectable 9 million units but was nowhere near the 74 million the 3DS sold. Which was to be expected as Nintendo cut all corners in trying to make the device very affordable. The build quality was poor, the buttons felt mushy and it was, due to its design, very uncomfortable to hold. Overall, the 3DS was quite a mixed bag. It had its pros and its cons. And now with the 3DS out of the way, it brings us to today. The Switch was released in 2017 and is still going strong today. It was a hybrid console that could be used both as a handheld or be docked to a TV. One of the key features of the Switch is the detachable Joy-Con controllers. The small controllers can be removed from the sides of the console and used separately for multiplayer gaming. They can also be attached to a Joy-Con grip to make a traditional controller or be used individually for motion control games. The Joy-Cons also have HD rumble which provides haptic feedback for a more immersive gaming experience. The Nintendo Switch has a more robust online system than the 3DS. The Switch allows for easier friend connectivity, voice chat, and access to online multiplayer. It boasts a 720p resolution in handheld mode and up to 1080p in TV mode. Speaking of the library of the games available, it is far bigger than any other previous generation due to the access to the internet and in the Switch being powerful enough to run big AAA titles like The Witcher, Doom Eternal, Nier Automata, etc. As it is going right now, Nintendo does not seem in a hurry to release their next-gen handheld, so it is very likely that the Switch is going to be here for a longer while. And that pretty much covers everything up. Hope you liked the video and I'll see you in the next one.